morning. Welcome to the sixth virtual edition of the State of Cannabis. Today we're going to focus on the 2020 election. Please use the chat for networking. You can rename yourself and add your company name so that we know uh, who you're with. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A section. I'll be monitoring that and we'll try and get to all of your questions. Um, we're about to experience something new. It's a three hour tiny town hall session where we're gonna have 12 candidates from the 2020 election and they're gonna have an opportunity to talk about their positions and solutions for, <clears throat> for the cannabis industry. Um, our first moderator is Felicia Carbajal. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for doing this, Felicia. Why don't you introduce yourself and then introduce the Congressman. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for having me. Um, grateful for the lot to be able to help you out last minute like that. I appreciate you so much and the work that you do. Uh, for our communities. Hello everyone, my name is Felicia Carbajal. My preferred pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am the Executive Director of the Social Impact Center and the Southern California Coordinator for National Expungement Week. I'm also an appointed delegate, so I'm super excited to be able to have this conversation with these elected officials in particular. Um, hopefully for all of us, it'll give us that necessary insight that we need in terms of how we develop relationships, how we also navigate this space, how we push people forward. So I'm super excited to be able to be here. For those who don't know um, Congressman Correa, he, his regions are in Orange County, Anah Anaheim, and Santa Ana. Um, he's recently called for criminal justice reform, um, reform via a C-SPAN interview. He's also condemned AG Barr on his investigation on our industry. So without further ado and without taking too much time, I feel like you're a very familiar face to our uh, community. Um, Congressman Correa, please take the floor and, and just introduce yourself briefly. Hey, you're muted. How about now? There you go. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody feeling today? A little hard. Thank you very much for that wonderful welcome this morning. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for being here this morning again, Senator Correa. Just, we're just going to go into dialogue, if that's okay with you. We're hoping to get some questions. That's absolutely awesome. Let's do it that way, Felicia. I like that idea. Perfect. So, because I've never had this conversation with you, and I'm sure a lot of other people know this answer, but I'd like to know when that pivotal moment in your life occurred. What was it? What was it about that made you a proponent of cannabis and uh, or marijuana reform? Thank you very much, Felicia. That's a great question. And it's one that uh, uh, I think it's probably been coming around for the last 40 to 50 years. If a lot of us think back um, to uh, President Clinton when he said, uh, I never inhale you often wonder in society how many people never actually exhaled. And then looking back at high school with most, you know, the culture then, and then the criminalization of cannabis, the, the, our drug policy in our society. And then I got elected to the California State Legislature. And I met this wonderful man, State Senator Vasconcelos, who had been a pioneer 25 years ago in moving uh, medical cannabis in the state of California. We're the first state in the, the union to move ahead with uh, uh, legalizing uh, medical cannabis in California. Then we just stalled. And I became good friends with Senator Vasconcelos, who uh, taught me a lot. He would medicate a lot for a lot of the issues that he had. And, and uh, as time went on, I, I found out that a lot of my veterans also were taking uh, cannabis as an alternative to opioid to take care of their traumatic stress syndrome issues. And, and then one day when I was in the state legislature, 
uh, California police chiefs. Out of all the groups in the world, the California police chiefs came to me and said, Lou, uh, it's time that we move forcefully ahead and started regulating cannabis, not prohibiting cannabis, but regulating cannabis. And that's what we began to do was uh, began to move a legislative agenda in the year 2012, 2013 that would turn from criminal to essentially regulating cannabis. And, and that's really a progression of what I did uh, in terms of my contribution to the legalization uh, background effort in cannabis. You're muted. Um, I was a late bloomer, so when you talk about high school and all of those things, they're a little bit foreign to me in particular. Um, but I'm super grateful for all of the work that you've done in particular and that awakening moment that you had. Um, now that we're 25 years later, 24 years later in the conversation, what do you envision for this industry, uh, Representative Correa? Well, let me say, first of all, that this industry, you know, the, the genie is out of the bottle, so to speak, and we are supposed to be moving forward. But I find it still surprising that there's still so many people that refuse to move ahead to legalize cannabis, refuse to move ahead to study cannabis as a medicine. Uh, as you know, I've had many uh, legislative efforts in the congressional level to ask the VA to study cannabis. I want to know what cannabis is good for when it comes to our veterans. What's it good for? What is it not good for? I think as policymakers, you begin to deal with the facts. And the legislative, the legal status of cannabis really stops us from studying cannabis. And I think it's sad because I've always thought of the United States as being at the forefront of medical research, being at the forefront of pharmaceuticals. And yet we have countries like Israel that are way ahead of us. And that tells me that we've lost our way somewhere. We still continue to you know, listen to political rhetoric instead of scientific facts. Um, what I see for the industry is we're at the tipping point. We're not going back yet at the same time, we are going to have to push even harder now. And I would tell the cannabis industry that uh, you can't make cannabis a partisan issue. We, you, all of us have supporters on the Democratic and Republican side. We need to make sure we have friends on both sides of the aisle continue to push forward for good public policy. Uh, we need to make sure that we continue to educate people and continue to invest and force the issue of research. We've had bills uh, that are proposed, that have been proposed. The State Act, for example, that was part of the HEROES Act. That bill, in my opinion, didn't really move the ball forward, but rather got us back to where we were a few years ago, which was a situation where you let the states do as the state should do. Yet the real impediment is federal legislation, federal law. And that's where we need to continue to focus. Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned, you know, some of the conversations and some of the things that we have to do in particular to engage our elected officials. What are some of the concerns you're hearing from people on the other side of the aisle? And what are some of the things that you're doing personally to help push them uh, to progress? Well, you know, I wouldn't say things on the other side of the aisle. I think we have a lot of Democrats also that have concerns. And I will tell you a story that I think kind of hits the nail right in the head. About five years ago, I was, at a, I was at a neighborhood meeting here in my district. And this Latina woman, probably in her 70s, came up to me and said, I'm dying of cancer. And the doctor told me, to turn to cannabis, to use cannabis. It'll help me, it may get me back on track, so on and so forth. And then she started crying and said, I'm not a marijuana, I'm not a drug addict. I am not going to smoke pot, that's not who I am. And 
I wanted to reach out to her and say, but do you understand that cannabis can help you? But there was nothing I could say that would change her mind because in our society for the last 60, 70 years, we've gotten so, so, you know, forced into thinking that marijuana is so evil that our drug policies have been some of zero tolerance without looking at the facts. It's not a partisan issue. It's rather an educational issue in our society. My thought is you got to have people be exposed to cannabis. You got to have people be exposed to the facts around cannabis so that we can begin to move forward. Uh, this woman probably passed away in pain, where if cannabis could have probably helped her, but she was sure that she was making the right decision by staying away from cannabis. Um, I remember in 2014 was the first time I went to visit a cannabis shop in my district. And it was interesting because I walked into that cannabis shop and it looked like a, a pharmacy, okay? Everybody there was dressed in a white coat. Everybody there seemed very professional. And I asked the young lady behind the counter, I said, what makes you an expert on medical cannabis? And she said, I've been smoking it for 25 years. And I thought to myself, we've got to have more than just that. We've got to have scientific research. We have to have people that stop, step up and give us some real scientifically based testimony. But until we change the federal laws, it's going to be very difficult to, for us to get there. Um, but remember also this whole issue of cannabis is really part of the underlying drug policy in this country. Um, we shouldn't be putting people away for smoking a joint. Our prisons are too full of individuals that have been put away for that exact thing, smoking a joint. We, we need to look beyond just cannabis and, and recognize that our drug policies have been a failure. I'm not saying go out and legalize heroin, but what I'm saying is, instead of putting people in jail for heroin, we need to put people uh, in a health setting so they can address their issues dealing with drugs as opposed to putting everybody in jail for drugs. And this is, in my opinion, a time that we need to really re-examine how we address drugs in this country. It's gonna be a tough uh, challenge for us to turn this super tank around, so to speak, of, of drug policy and begin to address it the way we should, that it's a health issue and not a criminal issue. Absolutely, thank you for that. I think more, ele more elected officials felt that way on both sides. We'd be able to push this a lot further, a lot faster. Um, and this kind of leads me to my last question. So it's gonna be two parts primarily because I want to be able to touch on the current election and I want to continue on on what you said. So my question to you as a government official is when will the amount of time and money spent on repair, i.e. expungement, reentry, social equity, community reinvestment, match or surpass the amount of time, money spent on prohibition, i.e. policing, incarceration, the creation of uh, collateral consequence, et cetera. I know it's a mouthful and it's a lot to, to dive into, but we have this unique time. It's an election year. We have uh, Biden uh, hopefully winning the election. And what does that look like in terms of when will the amount of time be commiserate with the experience some of us like myself have experienced uh, regarding cannabis? Let me answer it the following way, which is the point for us to begin to address this issue with common sense laws is way overdue. Right now, we have a lot of issues with police, police behavior, police training. And my proposition to you is that we have given our police an impossible job. We've given our public safety officers really an assignment that we're certain that, are going, that they are going to fail at. We've told police officers, enforce unenforceable drug policies. 
we've told our police officers, take care of the homeless. You have a shop owner that calls the police and says, make those homeless in front of my shop disappear. That should not be their job. And of course, the other issue is mental illness. We call the police when we see some, a person talking to themselves, a person violent, a person half-dressed out on the street. We call the police and say, take care of that problem. We have to change the way we deal with these issues. Mental health, drug policy, homelessness should not be a criminal issue. They should be issues for, for our healthcare system, for others in our society to deal with, for all of us to deal with. When have we, when have we reached that point? Well, we've passed the point of reaching that point. And, and let's not throw all of this on the public safety community. Let's not throw this on elected officials. Let's rather throw this on us as citizens and as voters. Now I'll give you an example. Here in Orange County, we were addressing the issue of homelessness just a, a few months ago. We have in Orange County, a hospital called Fairview Hospital, which has been a hospital that was built state money, federal money, state property to house the seriously mentally ill. One of our federal judges said, why don't we reopen that hospital to bring in those people that are homeless, that are so severely mentally ill that they can't take care of themselves and begin to rehabilitate them. And if they can't, this is a place for them to stay. Well, let me tell you the, the, the fight that we're having right now is that the city of Costa Mesa doesn't want those kinds of people there. The citizens in that area don't want that element there. And it's not only Costa Mesa, it's all our citizens in our cities. We don't want those homeless people in our area. We don't want those mentally ill around our families. When at the end of the day, those people are really our friends and neighbors, our family members, and but for the grace of God, some of us would be on the street. I think as a society, you've got to stop thinking about us versus them and start addressing these issues as all of us. And until we get there, we're going to continue to have this fight. You know, you can blame it on the cops, but the cops take their, their marching orders from the city council, and the city council takes their marching orders from the constituents that call at them and scream at them and say, fix these problems. It's not only Costa Mesa. Here in the city of Santa Ana, we have the same issues. But again, we've got to change the way we address these issues politically. And it starts with our friends and neighbors. Thank you for that. That's been a recurring theme just in terms of my personal life and some of the conversations I've been having with elected officials. We had one question in particular from one of our attendees that I'd like to pose to you. They asked, what self-interests or group industries, people do you feel provide the greatest bar uh, barriers to cannabis normalization? I'm thinking, I'm pausing because I would probably say in the past, it's been the public safety community. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think the greatest barriers now to the normalization of cannabis and the changing of, of uh, drug policy and how we address drug addiction is probably just society as a whole. Um, look at this election. I think both sides of the aisle, um, you know, drug policy changes are not part of the Democratic platform right now, and clearly not part of the Republican platform. I think it's an issue of education. And, and think about post-November election. We are looking at record deficits, deficits that we have not seen since World War II. We are looking at major challenges for this country. 
there are risks there and there are opportunities. I would say that this is the time to say, look, we have to stop investing money in programs that we know don't work. And we have to shift the way we do business and begin to implement policies that may have a chance of working. I don't think cops want to go out and arrest homeless people. Uh, as one of my local police officers here told me the other day, Lou, I don't want to go out and bust a kid who's smoking a joint. I have bigger things to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And as long as we be stop and have that honest conversation with people, I think we can move forward. Every day in my neighborhood here in Santa Ana, when I go jogging six in the morning, I can smell cannabis growing in the neighborhood, okay? Am I gonna call the police officer? Of course not. But there are probably people in my neighborhood that do wanna call the police officer. And I think it's just a matter of us as neighbors and friends learning how to deal with each other, how to live with each other. All of us have, all of us have rights and have responsibilities. And we have to recalibrate how we live with each other. Um, you know, just thinking about our public safety, our, our drug policy, our criminal justice system. A few months ago, I had a chance to visit our local juvenile hall here in Orange County. And most of the young ladies in juvenile hall were there for prostitution girls under 18 years old being locked up for prostitution. And probably most were there because of drugs, trying to get money to buy the drugs. Clearly our system is broken. Our young ladies should not be walking the streets to get their necks fixed. They should be in the healthcare system trying to figure out how to get back to normal in society. These are the issues I think we've got to address. And again, we're gonna have major deficits coming up in a few months, and the next president, whoever it is, has to reckon with these challenges. And I think that's a good time to kick the ties and say, let's figure out how to do this right and do it effectively. There is no answer, but all of us working together collectively may approximate some good solutions for all of us to live with for the next few years. Thank you so much, Lou. Um, you know, we're all behind you. Uh, let us know how we can support you. We thank you for your time. Do you have any final words uh, before we bring on our next candidate? Yes, I would just like to conclude by saying thank you and thank the audience for being active in the area of cannabis policy, cannabis normalization. And remember that this November is probably one of the most important elections of our lifetime. Please make sure you vote. And also remember, if you're going to vote by mail, to vote early because God knows what's going to be happening at the U.S. Post Office. We want to make sure that your vote is counted. And I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm not telling you how to vote Democrat or Republican. I'm asking you to vote your best interest. Thank you very much. God bless. And let's get busy. Thank you so much, Lou. Thank you.